All right, ready to go. Okay. Hello again. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, today, we're going to do our second session for the year for the working group. Um, this is our DLF working group, uh, Data and Digital Scholarship. Um, kind of a newer, uh, we're, kind of, um, we're bringing together two different initiatives, um, a, a former, uh, formerly the eResearch Network and the Digital Scholarship Working Group, um, kind of merging those around data and, and digital scholarship. We're excited to see everybody here today. Um, just want to uh, note the two facilitators in the room. Um, Sarah, again, Sarah Manheimer is here, um, and I'm, I'm here as well. Um, we both work at Montana State. Uh, and we help coordinate and bring the group together. It's just kind of logistical um, in a number of uh, ways. <clears throat> so uh, just reaffirming for the group, uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of outline a few of the things that we, we think and work on in here. Um, so it's a group that's kind of merging the, the research data services community and the digital scholarship community. Um, there could be lots of ways into this, uh, some of these goals. Um, typically what you'll see is something like what we're gonna do today, which is introduce a set of tools, maybe a speaker, um, maybe an exercise with that speaker. Um, today it's it's Devin Becker from the University of Idaho. Um, we also have a number of, uh, I noticed that the listserv has been, uh, it's a, a really great resource. There are lots of us on there. Um, more recently there's been a conversation around um, best practices or best results around DH workshops or topics for DH workshops. Um, so that listserv is um, available and uh, you can feel free to post there. I don't have a link to it in here. Um, overall, we're really just trying to build a community of practice for DS um, and for data services. That's really our goal here. Um, Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about one of the other um, components of this is a consultation. Um, and she's gonna talk a little bit about that right now just to kind of introduce it to the group. Yeah, so we have um, a consultation option that Jason and I had done when we were the eResearch Network and it was really fun. Um, it's like a matching of people who want to talk about a topic and people who are, you know, have expertise or more knowledge on that topic. And so the idea is you come up with like a project or a document that you want to workshop or um, we have more guidelines um, linked from this document here. Um, and we're asking you to sign up by February 5th, and we have space in this spreadsheet both for consultants and consultees, so people who want to get a consultation and people who want to provide some expertise. Um, and I, we made a little bit.ly link there, um, DLF DDS dash consultations um, to get you there if you can't click on these slides. So. It's super fun. And so if you're interested in signing up, please do. And if you have questions about it, you can ask um, me and Jason offline or we can answer questions at the end of the session too. Okay, go ahead, Jason. No, I was just gonna say, I'll, I'll drop the link into the uh, chat as well. Perfect. You can do that in a second. All right, so today we're really excited to have this session about static web tools and digital humanities practice. And then we're also going to have an activity where you sort of add your own metadata and you can see this collection builder tool in action that Devin's gonna talk through. Then we'll have wrap up and questions. So that's the basic structure of today's workshop or activities. Mm -hmm. And so our speaker today is Devin C. Becker. He's the head of data and, Di and digital services at University of Idaho. And he's the director of the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning. His talk today is called Confessions of a Static Web Convert. And he told us that he would provide a lot more information about himself. So all we're giving you is his title, but mm -hmm. we're excited to have you here, Devin. And um, I think that's it. You can take it away from here. I'm gonna stop sharing. <clears throat> Um, well, thank you, uh, Jason and Sarah, and uh, thank you to the DLF for, for providing this venue. 
Um, I'm really excited to be here and a little nervous. I didn't expect to be nervous on Zoom, but here I am. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the static web and kind of my uh, journey into kind of con conversion, basically <laughs> total conversion to static web practices uh, and, and um, kind of go through a few things here. Um, I also wanted to mention though, before I get going, you know, that e-research network uh, that Jason and Sarah ran was really important for the development of Collection Builder um, and for our practices at the University of Idaho Library. And I'm excited. That's a, a, another reason I'm so excited to be a part of this. Um, so let me go to present here. So this is what I'm hoping uh, that you all get from this today. Um, an understanding and overview of how static site generators work. We'll talk briefly about that. Um, the static templates that we work with at the University of Idaho, uh, which is Collection Builder and Oral History as Data, uh, and the models we follow, which um, are minimal computing uh, and lib static, which we, we call methodology. Um, I also hope you come away with ideas about the differences between systems and templates. Uh, I'm gonna kind of detail the models of, models for uh, dichotomy. Um, and then uh, the role of making and creativity in regards to digital practice and make some arguments about that. I also hope, uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk uh, really specifically about um, the, what it would mean to convert to a static web approach at your own, in your own practice, but I'm hoping like overall, you'll get a sense of, of what that means. Uh, and more generally, I hope you have a pleasant experience and some touchstones and resources to take with you. But there's a bunch of links at the last bit and I've got links and we'll put links in to this uh, presentation and all that. Uh, and it is a little longer, it's probably gonna take about 45 minutes um, uh, with, the, uh, with the activity as well. Um, so I wanna introduce me since I'm doing the confession and give you kind of the background. This is almost like a little resume, but I was born in Indiana, grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, I grew up Lutheran and majored in religion at a, at a non-religious college. So there's kind of a clash there, but thus the religious language, crippling self-doubt, et cetera. Um, I, uh, my kind of true passion uh, has always been poetry. I'm a writer. Uh, I got to study um, with the, our current Nobel laureate, uh, Louise Glick, which was which was starts, blew my mind when that happened this fall. Um, and then I have an MFA in poetry and published a book in 2015. Um, I uh, went and, and decided to kind of, you know, it's very difficult to become a poet in the ac in academia anymore. But uh, I really got into the libraries kind of the, the last bit of my teaching career there. And I got an MLS at Indiana University uh, and studied rare books and digital libraries. Um, particularly with Cotty Borner and in information visualization, Joel Silver at the Lilly Library, and John Walsh, who teaches digital libraries. Um, before I get totally into this, I want to acknowledge that the University of Idaho is on the ceded grounds of the Nez Perce tribe uh, and the traditional homelands of the Palouse Band of Indians. I acknowledge their presence here and recognize their continuing connection to the land, the water, and their ancestors. And this is a, a really important sp spot for the Nez Perce and uh, very privileged to be living in this area. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I am a white, middle-aged, heterosexual man uh, talking about technology using religious terminology, uh, which there are a few rhetorical situations that could be more frightening than that. Um, I also, I, I want to put, I, so I want to kind of acknowledge that right away and, and know that, that I recognize that. Um, and also that, you know, I, this is not the presentation in which we're sort of talking about uh, the social justice and uh, equity and inclusion sort of um, portions of the static web practice, but it, but they're very much there. And I saw the Alex Gills here and he's, he's spoken somewhat about that, but um, it, it's an important part of this approach. Uh, this isn't the presentation to go deeply into that, but I, I just wanna say that that's, that's always on my mind with some of this stuff as well. Um, professionally, uh, you've got my kind of titles here. I, I've been at the University of Idaho Library for a decade. Uh, I started as a digital initiatives and scholarly communications librarian, had another and job, and now I have kind of three administrative roles, including the interim head of special collections and archives, which is truly too much stuff, um, but we're in a kind of transitional moment. Uh, I've worked with a ton of systems, so just, you know, just so you know that I have that experience, Content DM, Vivo, WordPress, Omeka, some Drupal, OJS, uh, and, you know, but part of the reason I do so much static stuff is because of the experience with those systems. Um, and then we right now have an incredible faculty here and, you know, and, I've, and it's really grown in the last, you know, I'd say five years, especially, um, and I'm, I'm just extremely lucky to be working with my colleagues and uh, faculty and staff. Um, so before we get going uh, totally into this, I, I want to start with a little activity. It's going to be about three to five minutes. Uh, and so I have a linked uh, Google forum here um, and oh, let me go back here. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to kind of give a, give a, um, and you can use that bit.ly, uh, 
I'm going to try to read my chat over here. Um, Let me see if I can. I can somebody put that in the chat. I yeah, can. I can try to get it in there. So it's bitly. Bitly slash static DLF. Um, and there's a link to Google form there. Uh, and I'd like you to take the next three to five minutes to fill it out. And what I'm asking you to do is sort of uh, describe an encounter with another thinker's thoughts. Like I, I talk about a, a poet named Frank Bedard and, and the one that I have filled out and a couple, and, and a couple others. Um, and uh, talk about the, the, and just go look them up on Google, uh, you know, for the birth date, uh, get an image of the thinker as well. Um, and, and then talk about the, the date of the encounter, uh, the location it occurred. Um, you'll do, do that, you know, via the forms, and then a very brief description uh, in the medium and book in person, uh, etc. Um, and this is this should only take three to five minutes. I'm not, you know, it doesn't need to be, you know, spelling or copyright things. Don't worry about that. We'll put up a digital collection using Collection Builder using this data, and then we'll take it down right after this presentation. So it's it's just a kind of demo. Um, don't get too crazy about it, but you know, hopefully we can we can do something cool. Um, I'm also going to ask you to to add a um, some uh, coordinates. So if you see here, here's Moscow. Uh, if you so to add it that long to get that long, the easiest way I found right now is to just go to um, go to uh, go to Google Maps, right click on wherever your location is, and then click on that and it, it, click on the first option there. And that'll copy the latitude and longitude to the clipboard, you can drop that in exactly as it is uh, into the form, and then we will be filling out um, a spreadsheet here. So I will uh, wait for that and give you guys a few minutes to do that. Okay. And if there's any questions, you can either speak up or ask them in the chat. Which is weird. Sounds good. I'm I'm over there now, so I'm entering some metadata. Okay, about one more minute and we'll get going. Getting some in there, that's cool. Kevin, is there a size that the image needs to be? No, it's fine. Whatever image you get is fine. You know, we're, we're just gonna okay. kind of click through it. So um, teeny tiny will look a little worse, but it'll still okay. work.
All right, I'm going to get back. And if you need to finish some of that up while I'm talking, I think uh, the next bit will be a kind of overview of static web um, in general. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I call this a conversions of a static web convert. I think I talk about uh, these sort of practices as static web. I think there are, you know, in the in the DH community, especially it's talked about as minimal computing um, and uh, in another kind of other, a little bit other ways too. But so when I'm talking, you know, what people are talking about when they say static web generally is that they're talking about static site generators to create websites of static files, mostly HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, the, the, the large difference between the kind of tip, like sort of the most typical practice from the last decade of the dynamic site versus the static site is that static files are created at build time uh, rather th than in response to a page request. So like if you're going to a WordPress site, for instance, you enter in the URL and that opens and the site is building on the server and then served to you. Uh, whereas uh, for static sites, you build them at the time of development, um, cobble those things together, uh, it's all built, and then you put that and you can serve that from any server, uh, any, any basic web server out there or content delivery network. Um, and and it's, a, it's an approach that's becoming more and more prevalent uh, in the web development kind of community generally. Um, people also re may refer to Jam stack, and Jam refers to JavaScript plus API plus markup. Uh, there are some really, you know, this is more, a lot of the more kind of commercial uh, portions of this are kind of contained in this area. And there are some good uh, websites there, especially like jamstack.wtf, um, which is quite the extension. Um, so uh, when I'm talking about uh, static web a lot, I, I'm usually talking about Jekyll. Uh, Jekyll is a specific static site generator. There are quite a few static site generators. Um, many of them are in different uh, computing languages, JavaScript, uh, Go. Um, Jekyll is written in Ruby. Uh, and so that is the, 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 the software you need to, if you're going to develop on your own computer, download, etc. cetera. Um, and Jekyll's been popular for about a decade now. Uh, it was used on the 2012 Obama campaign. Um, one of its, it's got a couple kind of features that are particularly attractive to, to us. Uh, it uses this liquid language, uh, which is created by, by the company Shopify. Um, to create the templates. And that language is, is a fairly easy to learn templating language. It's not um, in, impossible to, it's, it's, it's pretty kind of like readable and, and usable. Um, and that does the programming portion. So the algorithms are the kind of the for loops and the if then sort of statements that create the templates that then build the site. Um, and there's also a built-in sort of data and collections function um, for Jekyll. Uh, and we're gonna talk, you know, so it was built initially to be a blog. Um, and and so it has a collection of posts built in. And that's one of the things that I sort of think is so, so powerful about this approach is it has a collection, it has the kind of idea of collection at its center, which I think is incredibly important for you know, archives, libraries generally, uh, something that we do really well, we have been doing really well for a very long time. Um, and it also, and then this, I have this underscore data here. Uh, it allows for iteration over CSV, uh, YAML, YML, and JSON files. So, uh, the data fo folder, and we can see that here, is where those those uh, th those data files are stored. Um, and this and the static site generator can iterate over all that data and build the templates and build all the the, the static websites from that data and the templates that you create. Um, so this is a typical kind of um, and so like a for for Jekyll specifically, usually you would go to one GitHub repo or directory on your local computer that has these directories inside of them. Um, so assets, uh, and then anything that has this underscore in front of it, Jekyll uses is kind of the magic part of Jekyll. Those are the places that Jekyll goes and, and looks at and builds all the static sites from. So data includes all the data files, as I mentioned. Uh, the layouts include the layouts for the individual pages that you're creating, maybe an about page or a home page, et cetera. Um, the posts is where they have a specific markdown formula for creating uh, blog posts that then can, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, functionality built in with those. SAS is for um, your, your uh, SCSS files, the, the kind of the configured CSS. Um, the config file there that is where you fill out kind of the base settings for your site usually. So maybe the site title, uh, if you're using plugins, this is where you declare them and a few other things. And then the index.md, and we usually have a pages uh, folder where we store all of our, a bunch of just markdown folders for the pages we're going to deliver. Um, and those are where those are where those created. And this isn't going to get like crazy into Jekyll. I just want to kind of, you know, give you the overview. But, but, you, but so Jekyll uses all of that stuff there. Um, it goes into the gears here. 
uh, and, and, and inject literates over all of that and produces the static site that can be served um, from GitHub pages, for instance, which is a, which is a free service, uh, or from other content delivery networks, which a lot of those are free right now too for static sites, um, or via any of your own, any web directory you may have access to. Um, so at the University of Idaho, uh, we have a sort of specific static stack that we work with to build uh, the tools that we make, um, oral history as data and collection builder, uh, and, and all of this, the project sites and our library website and everything else. Um, and this is this is it. So Jekyll, as I just went over, is our static site generator. Uh, we use Git, GitHub to, as a way to collaborate and track changes, uh, our versioning uh, kind of basic. And then we also use that to publish a lot of websites. Um, our collection builder site for, is, is published at collectionbuilder.github.io, which is a GitHub pages site. Um, so we don't need any infrastructure besides uh, a GitHub account to, to, to you know, edit that site. Um, we use Bootstrap uh, to, as a framework to kind of ease our development process. Um, and all that means is that you know, it has kind of uh, pre-configured CSS and JavaScript um, interactions that you can use basically by just adding classes to your HTML. So the templates that we use uh, use a lot of cards, which is a, or, or the type of buttons that they have. You could you can implement modals, you can have um, different things like that, but it just allows for like a faster um, kind of development model and, and it's kind of cleaner CSS. You don't have to hand code all that. And then the data files that we use, uh, comma separated values files, uh, which is, you know, a simple plain text version of a spreadsheet and YAML, which is, you know, basically kind of a list with values and elements uh, defined um, kind of in, in basic text files. Um, so why did we, why do people use this for development? Because of that pre-configuredness, because it's built before, uh, you know, at the time of, at the build time rather than at delivery time, it's faster, uh, it's more secure. Um, so a lot of the stacks that people work with, like our, our, our LAMP stacks that use PHP, for instance, um, and we were not allowed to use PHP at, some, at one point because we were getting, you know, we've, we had quite a few hacks. We, we have the, our last PHP site is a WordPress site, uh, Vandal Poem of the Day. Um, and that one is continually getting, you know, people are trying to hack it and things like that. Uh, this, you know, these sites, you know, not impossible to, to get into and break, but it would be kind of more of a password break. And these are, you know, you're not going to have those kind of like spam bots that a lot of like older WordPress sites or some Drupal sites end up being. Um, there's lower barriers to publishing. Uh, GitHub Pages, as I mentioned, is a free way to publish on GitHub from a static uh, site. And there's no server required. So you're not having to update uh, the software. You're just having to keep track of, of the content that you're creating. Um, and most sites are GitHub, GitLab uh, repositories. Um, so that can, you know, those easy to integrate with other services and their collaborative uh, version developed kind of places. Um, and so why is this kind of important for libraries DH? Um, I think it kind of embodies a lot of the library archives values and practice. It's, it's uh, metadata data driven. So that collections is data ideal. Um, we, I think one of the big parts about this is it allows a, more people to participate in the kind of creation uh, an envisionment of uh, the, the design and delivery of, of information. So we work a lot with collaborative Google Sheets. Um, so much of our website is built at that with, with that anymore. And, you know, so and people are already ready to get into those and to think about the data in those terms. And they don't have to, you know, start learning, you know, thinking about a database or, or have to kind of distinguish between the two. Uh, they can just kind of learn that data is that thing that they entered into the cell. Um, it's collection oriented, uh, you know, we, we try to kind of build under these, this sort of like with that collections as data model in, in mind, but also the collections in context that we need to treat our special collections as such um, and really it, it, and communicate the value of uh, that, uh, of a collection, you know, that the history of the collection, the context of a collection, because I do think collections become more than the sum of their items. Um, it's preservable. Uh, a, a static site's going to probably, you know, going to work in 10 years, um, given the browsers are still, you know, functioning the same way we expect them to. Uh, but it's not, you're not going to have to maintain um, PHP or Drupal or, or something like that, that might, uh, you know, that I think a lot of the DH projects from the early 2010s, um, not a lot, some of them are, are no longer because or are no longer working because, they, you know, it's very hard to keep that maintenance up. Um, there's also kind of a wide open development. Uh, we use issues a lot in GitHub for our website. And maybe uh, you would be um, sort of annoyed uh, trying to get a presentation ready and you messed up the spreadsheet and you're getting pinged. Um, and maybe you have a little passive aggressive uh, confrontation there. 
Um, but then it's it's all open, it's all out there. Uh, maybe you know you can learn to kind of take yourself a little less seriously that way too. So that collaborative, iterative part of that too is there, uh, and then the sort of modular aspect of it as well. All of these pieces, um, you know, especially with the Jekyll way, um, everything is kind of like a nested doll effect. You have an includes and you have a layout. Uh, and you're always kind of building uh, in this fashion. So it's, it's very modular, it's, it's truly reusable and reproducible, um, which I was actually kind of impressed by uh, in creating this. I'm gonna look back at some older kind of the initial uh, experiments with Jekyll and, and I was able to recreate the pages that I was working with at that time. So getting to my own kind of conversion narrative, uh, I only took, you know, I, my, my writing kind of passion is poetry and I, I took one fiction class uh, and, and was able to take it for like a few days. I was like, I can't do this. Um, but I still remember one of the, you know, one of the instructors kind of major points about fiction or narrative is that you need two things, right? You need characters you care about and trouble. And if, you know, if you're going to lose one, it's the characters. Um, so, you know, what is the trouble? And I've sort of hinted at this already, but, uh, you know, and then I'm also going to um, talk about a, a Frank Bedart poem later. And uh, one of the lines there is, uh, says like, what you initially apprehend in passion becomes opinion. Um, he does it better than that. But, you know, I, I think that there's a, in kind of thinking about what's driving a lot of what we do is, I was looking back at my career here and thinking about like the kind of first initial impressions I had starting my job. So, you know, 2010, uh, I was a digital librarian, didn't have a whole lot of, you know, didn't know a lot. Um, but I was pretty, you know, and was, was thrust into kind of maintaining a content DM right away. Um, and what I realized though was that, you know, I, I was really disappointed with the way that special collections were treated um, and especially digital libraries. Uh, you know, I, I came from, you know, working at the Lilly Library and seeing what, you know, these amazing collections and kind of getting to experience them in the back rooms and uh, having, and just having such a powerful experience there. And then you see them online and they're like little bitty thumbnails and they're treated as a kind of item in a catalog rather than as a collection. Uh, that has meaning in itself. And uh, I, I, you know, I was like, that doesn't seem right. And it still doesn't seem right to me. I still think a lot of the systems that we work with don't do a very good job of that. Um, and then, you know, the, the why are these systems so difficult to customize? I mean, like, I knew how to work with spreadsheets. I knew how to work with data in that way. I knew files and folders when I first started. Um, but, you know, I, you know, in order to get anything online, especially at that point, you know, I needed a, a MySQL database uh, for 100 images and 100 rows of data. And that, you know, initially I was like, oh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm like, I'm wondering if you could do that. And, you know, I, I was too, you know, new to think that maybe I was right. But I think like, as, as the static stuff kind of came up, I really realized like, whoa, you, that's actually, all you should need is 100, 100 images in a spreadsheet and create a website from that. And that's kind of the goal in, uh, of Collection Builder itself. Um, initial solutions, uh, pre Evan, Olivia, I'm gonna talk about them, the characters in a second. Uh, in our static approach, I, I used XML and XSLT uh, to do a lot of the, the of, to create a lot of X of static sites. Um, and this, and, and that was sort of pre uh, our use of Jekyll. And we were able to build these templates on top of Content DM uh, to add that contextual piece to the collections. Um, I also did a lot of find and replace over our live website, which I think is kind of terrifying to me now. Um, and I know it's terrifying to my colleague, Evan, who's on this uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, but the difficulties with, with this approach, especially was, was really difficult to update. I'd have to run through this kind of like, you know, intricate workflow every time I needed to update a site, uh, essentially rebuild it fully. Uh, and that wasn't built in like it is with Jekyll. Um, it was hard to build out individual pages, although we finally got there uh, with kind of XSLT 2.0. Uh, it was not collaborative. So all the maintenance ended up on me and there was just no, there was just very little development malleability. It wasn't able, it was hard to kind of recreate some of the things that we were doing. Um, so here are the characters and nay heroes. Uh, and, and really like I'm going to, I'm talking a lot about kind of my own uh, journey here, but uh, the work with Olivia and Evan, uh, Olivia Weichel and Evan Williamson who are pictured here uh, in a throne and using three computers with Visual Studio Code, code Up, which I'm still impressed by, uh, or three screens. Uh, they are my colleagues. They're the ones who've kind of driven um, the, we, we work on the static stuff all together. Uh, we're very collaborative. Uh, they're, you know, we're on, all the, on all the grants with me for Collection Builder and uh, Oral Histories Data and everything else that we do with CDIL and the website at, at here and everything else. So 
Um, Evan is the one who initially introduced the static web uh, approach here. He kind of came out of his work with the Carpentries uh, and he started a, a, with the Argonaut, our, our newspaper our digital collection was kind of the first in production uh, static site that we had. Uh, and Olivia came on um, in 2018, uh, right as Evan and I had decided we needed to redesign the whole website using static approaches. Um, but then we also had to go on vacation in July. And so her second month was uh, basically, um, Evan and I had gotten things going. We're like, okay, so now you're gonna kind of run the, uh, the website revision entirely. Um, so she did that right away. And I think she's forgiven us for that. Uh, but uh, it, it, an excellent colleague to, you know, has brought so much of, of, of the, her kind of recent experience and she came from Indiana University as well. Um, but so I'm gonna kind of step through a few of the kind of conversion steps via my own epiphanies uh, with, uh, with these productions. Um, and we're gonna look specifically at control shift. And so I was looking back for this at my old, at kind of the initial uh, Git commits that I was making when I was working with this. And I think you can see here, I hate computers being the main, main one. Um, but this, this first uh, kind of this, this poem generator, uh, you know, there's the famous Stephen Ramsey um, article about uh, the hermeneutics of screwing around um, and, and DH and how important that is. And I, I really do believe that that sort of play aspect of DH is such an important part. Um, and so, you know, and, and at some point that summer, I worked with two graduate students. Um, and I'm just going to click into control shift here. Uh, the two grad students, um, uh, so Corey Oglesby and, and Lauren Westerfield were our first graduate fellows with the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning, which is our DH center. Um, and we just, you know, we had just, I just started learning this technique and we had some ideas about ways we might want to uh, look at, uh, you know, I, ha I, had, I had done these series of interviews with poets across the country um, and we wanted to uh, picture them and I didn't really want to just write an article about them. I had audio and video, I had images from their, you know, from visiting them. Um, and I had transcripts at this point, and I just wanted to find a way to put everything up, to open it up as wide as possible. Um, and so I got to, you know, and we were, I was very lucky to work with these two uh, graduate students who are both um, excellent writers and, and uh, you know, crazy intelligent um, Moscowites right now too. Uh, and so we had these ideas and, and one of them was this page. We thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to kind of visualize the writing process in like a table? And if you hovered over it, you would get uh, you know, the idea of what, it, of, of what they said, and then you could click in and, and read about it. And so we were able to kind of, build, and, and, and you know, that, uh, that first summer, we were able to build this um, in a very early stage, but it was able, it was working. Uh, and then we were, and then we were looking at some of the, you know, some of the things we, uh, we, we put everything up on YouTube and YouTube has the automatic transcription uh, thing and I had it back then, it's a little different now, but the way that it transcribed, it kind of flattened the language and it had it in these what looked like to me like lines. And so I was talking to Corey uh, and, and Lauren about that. And we we're like, well, wouldn't it be cool to do like a poem generator? And then we were able to, to create that in that first year and using very much the Jekyll techniques of we turned this, it was like an SVV file um, downloaded from YouTube, turned it into a CSV and used it uh, here. Um, and it just essentially kind of a simple uh, formula of like, you know, create this, do a little, you know, shuffle it with our, you know, our uh, JavaScript shuffle and, and put it back up. Um, so then you can, you know, every time you do this, it's a new poem. Um, and this has led to some other kind of work that I've, I've done through the years. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I'm going to talk about this in, in just a second, but this is the visualization we came up with. Uh, well, I'll just talk about this. Now, this is my third epiphany, but I'll, I'll skip over it. But um, and then so like, you know, it built this the first year and it kind of sat around for a couple years. We had a couple more oral history uh, projects come into the CDIL and we really, and I realized, you know, like this data was all starting to kind of work the same way. Um, and we had had, you know, we had, so if you click in, you can see that here. Um, but we had created this sort of, you know, um, and using, you know, using the, actually the, 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 the system ohms as sort of a model, like, you know, we wanted to search for, you know, wanted to be able to search and see and filter by the topics that we had coded and things like that. Um, but uh, I also was, you know, starting to think, I, you know, having worked in this for a while, uh, you know, and starting to think with the data, starting to think about it in a very specific way and starting to kind of, you know, think with, not only with the data, but also the templates and the visualizations and the ways you can use rectangles and things like that. And that really led to this, I, I mean, I still remember the kind of morning I was thinking about it thinking like, well, if we, if we color code, if we had some sort of color coding, we were able to create rectangles, 
uh, for each little section of of the thing of uh, of this of the transcript, which you had already put into a CSV at this point. Like maybe we could do something where you know we could see what everybody's talking about when they're talking about their career and kind of compare that and, and go down. And then if we wanted to filter that, we could filter that down um, and things like that. And so uh, and then you know I, I'm going to go back here. Let me see here. Um, but that sort of, and here's my thing here, where all of a sudden that visualization was working. You know, I could, I pictured it in my mind and was able to get to that point. And I think, you know, I, I'm going to call that the kind of, I was, I was pretty well into it by then. It was pretty well gone. But that was the kind of moment was like, oh, wow, this is not only like uh, an approach that makes it easier to publish. It's better, more collaborative, uh, more interesting to me. But it's also, you know, I think it felt to me like a creative process, a kind of craft process uh, that I was familiar with from my own background. And, and that, you know, I think that's the power, you know, something that I think is just incredibly powerful. Um, there was one other kind of early version of Collection Builder here where we were working with our own content DM data. Uh, and then we had this uh, symposium every summer with uh, WSU, which is eight miles away. Um, and I was able to get some content DM data from them. Uh, and they sent that over and, and I got that, I got their data to work. And I, that was another moment where I was like, oh, wow. So, we, you know, not only we can do this for ourselves, but other people's data, if it's structured in the same way, it also will work. And so I think that was like when we were like, oh, wow, okay, there's a, there's a whole lot now. And so there's no turning back, right? Uh, the website needs reading and revision, why not static? We have problems with Omeka for teaching, why not static? We moved to a hosted content DM, lost a lot of our functionality uh, in, in customization. So why not put a static skin on top? Um, and so, you know, at this point, we've, 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 we're totally gone, um, and, but we're, we're enjoying it. We think it's a really powerful and, and, and excellent way to do this. Um, so our library website is, is statically built. Uh, it's collaboratively developed. Um, we have, you know, most of our, you know, reference and instruction, spec, staff, uh, other staff working uh, in GitHub to help us build content and, and think up new things. Um, Argonaut, that's one of our first collections. Uh, Letters of Marine Mancini, uh, of Marie Mas Mancini is a translation project that Olivia runs. Uh, Voices of Gay Rodeo is another project that came out of our work uh, kind of with control uh, shift and that. Um, and then we have this new blog that we've built uh, using Collection Builder kind of doubly to also create a digital collection and a blog that's kind of connected. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then the other thing, you know, I said here, the static projects uh, and one of the other powers about this is that they can turn into these templates. So for instance, you know, some of our early work building for our, for content DM and uh, turned into collections, collection builder, right? And, um, and that's the little logo for collection builder here. And I, I'll have links to this presentation later and, and a PDF link as well. And everything here is linked and described. So if, if you wanna get in and kind of click on things, you're welcome to. And then oral history as data became the tool that we took from the kind of visualization that we built first with control shift and now has kind of gone back and forth, but that visualization is also used in Voices of Gay Rodeo. So it's it's kind of awesome to see this all work together uh, and go from there. And so now I'm going to kind of give you a demo of Collection Builder, um, and then we'll return to a few to kind of a sort of more uh, a little more theoretical discussion. Um, but so this is the Collection Builder website. Uh, there's a lot of data here. Um, there's a lot of doc. We've done a ton of documentation, and we have a, a workshop tutorial uh, here as well. There are three kind of basic types of, of uh, collection builder. We have a GitHub pages version, which is the simplest one, uh, which we're going to use today. Uh, we have a standalone version, which we're, which we're actually just about to release a new version of uh, that'll be really heavily uh, kind of metadata dependent. You know, a lot of customization and uh, control that way. Uh, but right now, it's still, you know, you can use it too and has some built in, but that's for developing on your own computer and, and kind of building out bigger collections. And then we have the skin version for content DM right now. Uh, that builds on using uh, metadata from Content DM. You can just drop it in, and it'll build a, a site for you using their API. Um, but we're going to look. Uh, I want to look specifically at uh, the GitHub for here. Um, and so I'm going to start this uh, collect. Do this is going to be a demo using uh, the data that we have. So um, you see the data here. Um, everyone put in uh, some really cool uh, epiphanies. Oh, I'm really excited to see this. Uh, and so you can see, I, you know, I ch changed the titles of the different things to fit with the metadata that we use for Collection Builder. Um, in order to make it work, we need a few more uh, kind of things here. So I'm going to scroll over here. Oh, that's not what I want. Scroll here. 
drag down. I practiced this, so I hope this will work. Uh, we have a couple issues here, but that shouldn't break anything. Just won't be on the map. Um, and then we are going to download this as a CSV. And I will open this in my folder. And I'm going to, I don't think you can see this, but I'm renaming it just Epiphanies so it's a little easier to see. Um, and then at the same time, I'm going to go and I think I actually have it up here. I'm going to go to the Collection Builder GH template. Uh, and this is a really powerful button here. This use this template. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, I'm going to click this. It's going to build. It's going to take copy all of that, take the, copy that entire repository. Um, I'm going to call this DLF DDS uh, and make it public. And I'm going to create the repository. So it's, good. so it's copying all that material in there. Uh, it gets rid of when you use the template. It gets rid of the the Git history. So you've got a, a kind of clean state to, to develop on. But everything that we have built in um, is built in. Um, and once that happens, it should only take a few seconds. Uh, then we're going to do a few things to get this set up. Um, we're going to load our data here, and oops. Um, So I copied this epiphanies.csv here. Uh, I'm just going to use the basic commit here, make a commit there. And you can make a message in, to yourself if you're going to do a little bit further. Uh, made that change. And then I'm going to change this config YAML. Uh, we're going to do two things here. And you actually don't need to do this. You can just delete the URL and base URL now. They've just changed this. Um, but, tip, but before we had to change these URLs so that the, the website and the links gets, get built correctly. Um, this is the config YAML. So this is the main, uh, we'll call it epiphanies. Um, counters with thinkers. I, don't, I know thinkers is such a sort of terrible name, but, uh, and then we're gonna call this epiphanies. And so this metadata value here, um, and, and we do, you know, I link to tutorials and things, so I'm not going to go too too in depth with it. But this is where this this is is saying go to the CSV in the data folder, and that's going to be used throughout this collection to build the site. And so we're going to create this. Um, do that here, uh, and then our next step is just to turn it on. Um, and so, as I mentioned a number of times, this is we're going to use GitHub Pages to freely publish this. Uh, all we need to do is change the branch to the master, and that'll be changing to main soon. Um, and uh, we saved it. So I've made two commits so far: I've, one to add the, the CSV, uh, and one to, um, uh, to to change the kind of basic configs. Um, and so let's see what we got here. It might take a second to build. So now we're going to wait and, and let the um, let it build. In the meantime, this is something we typically do: is copy the link address and just add it to the about to the kind of about section here, so you have it all the time. And save the changes, um, and you can do this as well. Uh, if I mean, if you want to kind of follow along, um, me. If you wanted to kind of go through this on your own, I'm going to just drop the, the spreadsheet link here. And I think it's just view only, but you should be able to download that. Um, if you wanted to go through this, the process that I just did, you could, you could see that. So let's see. So of course, any, anything you do live is going to do that. So there's a couple other things I'm going to do here. Um, so, uh, you know, we have these kind of object IDs, which are really important for Collection Builder. They're kind of the, the, the key to, to so much. Um, I'm going to use this picture of Frank Bedart that I have in as our uh, homepage picture. Um, and so this, we have this theme YAML in our data folder uh, that kind of defines a lot of the little features for different pages. Um, so that's going to be uh, the featured image is going to be that, uh, that one. Um, we could add a different one to here. I'm just going to make one, pick one at random, say 10. Um, we have, we want a subject page. We're going to, this is going to be like a word cloud. Um, and we're going to use medium here. Uh, location's good. And we're probably going to be all over the map. So I'm going to move this zoom level and maybe even international up. So we're going to make a few changes to the theme and build those in. Let's zoom in, of course. Let's 
Okay, there it goes. Um, so we've got some, uh, so we're going to probably have some issues, um, but we do have, we've got one picture of WB Dubois here. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and a few, a few others. Uh, and now we have a collection of 26 items, um, each described and uh, pictured. Oh, Amanda Gorman from yesterday. Uh, Tracy Smith, uh, another great poet, Thomas Kuhn. Oh, wow, this is great. Um, so a few of these are mine. Uh, we're going here. Uh, oh, that's cool. And then so, so basically we've taken the data, popped it in, and then this, a lot of things are being automatically generated. We've got a, a page for everything. These are the different uh, kind of the mediums through which uh, the things were e experienced. Um, the timeline is going to, uh, is, is the timeline is based on uh, the date of the encounter. Um, you could change that to the date of the uh, individual if you want. Um, some of the images didn't come through as you can see, but you know, that's just the way it is. You would go back and fix the data rather than going back and fix the code. Um, and so I think that's another kind of powerful piece. Uh, and, here's, and here's sort of uh, that timeline. And then we can see a map, um, which, okay. So, you know, I bet what broke here is uh, with the, so probably if I went through and kind of deleted some of this, oh, and we have some different coordinates here. Um, so that. That. Um, well, it, it does work. Uh, the map does work here. I'll, I'll show you. Um, this is just a test I did yesterday to kind of, you know, I just grabbed a few here, but the map looks like this. Uh, one thing I wanted to show in the timeline and the features here too is, you know, you can create different kind of integrations uh, and different layouts. And so for the timeline, you know, if you wanted, we've got that kind of base, kind of table-based timeline. Um, but if you wanted to create, uh, say, a slightly different, that kind of a timeline JS look here, I'm just going into the, our pages and going into the markdown and changing the layout. Uh, this is called front matter in the markdown for here uh, to timeline JS. Um, and to do that, then we'll change, basically, uh, now, now uh, GitHub Pages is rebuilding the whole site and rebuilding using a different kind of data setup and things for that page specifically, and we'll load the timeline JS setup that we have uh, based there. And hopefully um, that one will work in a few seconds. Um, so yeah, and, and the other thing while we're waiting for that to build, the other thing I wanted to point out about collect about collection builder is we've got, you know, we've really kind of forefront the collections as data model and have all these different kind of models about. Um, of the of of the different you know here's a metadata JSON file of the entire thing uh, you have a subjects JSON geodata JSON the timeline JSON which this is the um, this is the JSON that runs that uh, runs the timeline JS um, so you can use that in another situation uh, we also have this facets JSON file which I think is really great um, you can define the facets that you want to use. Uh, Oh, we don't have we, we didn't define it well in the theme but you can you can use this to look at your data for an entire collection especially a larger collection and kind of start to learn things about that and then use that to make some of the visualizations that you'd like um, so okay so now I'm, i refreshed it uh and now we just changed that one thing and we have this timeline of people's experience with prince uh playing basketball listen to a boom box with purple ring oh that's a nice one um, and so winning the, so yeah, so from 1980s all the way through. And so this is, I think this is probably the right timeline for this collection and you can kind of make that decision there. Um, so, wow, that, that was, uh, thank you guys for participating there. That was, that was fun. Um, and I hope it kind of demonstrated some of the, the ease and some of the power too that's there with this, with this version. And so I'm just, you know, the forms of collection builder here, uh, we've used it for a lot of different things to work with graduate students, community groups, faculty, uh, teaching archival research. That was kind of a, one of our initial kind of ploys here. Uh, we're moving, you know, this is Collection Builder too. We, we're, we're doing this Digital Library of Idaho project right now, a kind of collections of collections, and then eventually a collection of all the items. Um, but, you know, to start, we're just describing collections in a spreadsheet and doing things like that. Oh, we're gonna talk about WAX in a second. I just saw that uh, they, they released a kind of collection of collections more recently um, about, uh, I think, Caribbean uh, DH uh, projects not too long ago. Um, and then this is this is a thing we're working on with our with our CDIL grad fellows. Um, and I'm going to just click into here uh, to sort of demo this. Um, but this is built, and they have 
they've been really fun to work with. They, they're talking about the loss of the North Idaho's Mountain Caribou, so it's sort of a collection of absences. Um, they, the, the, they've sort of disappeared from, from the lower 48. Uh, and so they, they wanted this, you know, fake 404 page. Um, and uh, we, we're be, we've been using this kind of, this new kind of CSS, this is tuftyc.css, uh, which kind of presents it in a way like Edward Tufty presented some of his uh, textual documents. Um, and I'm getting this, the students to kind of write into this as well, uh, using Markdown um, as well. But the one thing I wanted to show here was uh, this Debbie Ackley. So they did all these oral histories of people's encounters with that. And so we, we took basically Collection Builder and just put it on top of our map. And then we used a little bit of, and we use Leaflet for the maps. Um, and then, you know, as this is kind of like a, a night lab story map kind of thing, but, you know, we wanted people to kind of have a deep map, that map experience of this, uh, of this collection. So you can view the map and get into that a little more, or you can go back to view the item. And so you move back and forth to all these different items. And, and at the same time, you're moving kind of across geographical space. Uh, so we, we thought that was pretty interesting as well. Um, so there's a lot of applications, there's a lot of extensions and, and uh, ways of dealing this uh, based out of this sort of static way of, of doing it. And so what I really wanted, to, uh, sort of the, more of the theoretical part of this, you know, more recently, uh, there's a great uh, thread from Alex Gill and, uh, and Quinn Dombrowski and a few others, uh, and Maureen Irop, who uh, works with Alex on uh, WAX and uh, Ed and Minicomp. Um, and, and they were talking about the difference uh, initially about Wax and Omeka, and then uh, I have a link here to, to Mari's take on difference between Wax and the Collection Builder and Omeka. Um, but Alex made some really important kind of distinctions about uh, the difference between the two. And, and I, I, these are linked here if you want to go in and, and check this out um, or go to Alex's uh, Twitter feed. Um, but he's talking about the, the way that the sort of maintenance here and the design aspects of, of Wax versus Omeka uh, and how, how much easier it is to, to kind of mess with the design of of a, of a wax, which is a, which is the Jekyll project, the Jekyll template as well. Um, and also the, the, the way that it's just, you know, you're maintaining, I, I think his last point here, this, uh, this means we maintain software, not documents that for Omeka and some of those other systems. And I think that's a, you know, that's a real uh, problem when you're thinking about kind of archival collections and things like that. And then Amari's take about, uh, you know, moving into this static approach more, or, you know, for them, it's, you know, they call it very much minimal computing. Um, you know, you get more control, but you also have to think a lot more about the workflows and how it will include your collaborators and things like that. Um, but, and as I was sort of thinking about that, and I'm not gonna get into Geertz too much, uh, I just wanted to put up where, where my ideas were kind of coming from. I was thinking back to my own kind of uh, education and thinking about the difference between a model of and a model for. And the way that I'm sort of thinking of a model of, model for, a sort of, sort of uh, binary here is, um, model for is kind of prescriptive systems for replicating information. And a model of is a, an idealized expression of information meant to be mimicked. So, uh, you know, they're not kind of, it's more of a spectrum than it is like a, two sides of a coin. Um, so I think of it kind of that way. But if you think of Legos, and I just did this this weekend, so I, this was on my mind, but a model for, and this is where I would say, you know, Omeka is more towards this spectrum, a, a kind of system that's, that's very prescriptive, that, that makes you kind of go through these very steps every time. And does it for a reason, because it's easy, you know, it's, it, it takes away a lot of breakage. It takes away a lot of issues with the initial kind of setup uh, and some other parts. Uh, but you're, but you're, you're kind of stuck in that model, right? You, you fill out the forms, you push the buttons, you create the, you create the experience. And that, and that especially goes for the educational point of that. And then whereas a model of, you're kind of working like you, a model for being you work just with the instructions all the time. And a model of, you're looking at what you can build or the picture on the front of the box, and you're going towards that. So it's more creative. It's it's more, and then you can go and say, oh, actually, I want to do this to that. I want to take a couple steps back and redo this part of, of this weird boat that I built. Um, so right now, I think you know we're we're calling our collection builder on our website a tool. Uh, but I just you know, and I just kind of messed with the site and, and went through here. But I wanted to say that you know we described it in a grant more recently as a flexible open source template for creating digital collection and exhibit websites. And I think that's more what it is. It's more of that model of uh, for you to start with this model, it's got a demo site right away, and then you can start, and then you know you can go from there and, and edit every single piece of it that you want. Um, the other part about being a model of, I think, uh, and Geertz makes this distinction: a model of is often like an idealized kind of worldview, right? And so it's also interesting to me that you know Wax is just, it's a static project and, and Collection Builder both come from you know both have very specific sort of uh, worldviews attached to them, and, and you know Alex and Mari kind of call, call Wax a provocation. 
uh, and it's very nimble and lightweight. Uh, you know, they've used it to, to document um, kind of ICE detention centers and things like that. Uh, and so it has a lot of environmental and social justice origins and aims that I think are incredibly important uh, to the community and to, to, to kind of demonstrating the power. Uh, but it, you know, it definitely has this kind of worldview that, that it's idealizing in its, in its expression. Um, and Collection Builder comes out of something we call the static. And that's a, we, we think of it as a methodology and it comes, you know, it comes much more from our working space where, uh, you know, kind of libraries, collections, data centric, uh, where we have this collections, this data and collections and context kind of idea behind it. But they both have this kind of worldview that, that, they're, that, that are driving a lot of the distinction. And so this is live static and, and uh, you can go to this site and, and read this more in depth, but the methodology is that we're, you know, we're building things that are open, simple, library optimized and user focused. Um, and we're also working towards building LibStatic into a site, and this is on me that it's not up yet, that collects some of the tools and, and well, templates and uh, like kind of one-offs and things like that that are built in static so that it become a resource that people can go and find the individual code pieces so they can really use the modular power of this and, and build things in. Um, and that we're hoping to have that up in the near future. So I kind of want to end on this idea that, you know, uh, is there such a thing as creative librarianship? Can we get to a point where we see uh, what we're doing more as a craft or creative activity than uh, maybe scholarship or kind of business run things? Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of different uh, Frank Bedard poems. Uh, this is called Advice to the Players, and both of these will be from his book Stardust. Uh, there's something missing in our definition vision of a human being, the need to make. We are creatures who need to make. Because existence is willy-nilly thrust into our hands, our fate is to make something, if nothing else, the shape cut by the arc of our lives. My parents saw corrosively the arc of their lives. Making is the mirror in which we see ourselves. But being is making not only large things, a family, a book, a business, but the shape we give this afternoon, a conversation between two friends, a meal, or misshape. Without clarity about what we make and the choices that underlie it, the need to make is a curse, a misfortune. And I think that last line, and this, this poem goes on, on uh, for a number of, a couple of pages more. It's, it's very powerful. It's the first poem in the book. Um, it is, uh, it kind of defines that. I mean, we need to know, you know, the choice, kind of understand the clarity about why we make and the choices that we're making. And I think um, this approach to, to, to building these sites, to building these digital scholarship projects, to building exhibits, to building digital collections uh, is better in that, in that capacity. Um, so this is the question, right? Is there such a thing? Uh, what changes? Um, here, wait, let me go back up. What changes when we treat digital scholarship, digital librarianship as a craft? Uh, and do we want? And, and so I, I mean, kind of the, the corollary of this is the, you know, I feel like we might, you know, some of the work we sort of adopted the wrong metaphors, and I see this a lot in kind of library work generally, where, where we're going towards these sort of business models or kind of startup models or tech models. Uh, or we're trying to be completely on the scholarly track and measure our impacts and things like that. And I just, you know, some, something about those, and I mean, I think there's areas where that's very important to measure our work in those matters, but uh, for some of what we do in, in DH and, and digital scholarship, uh, I feel like, you know, is there a way to better encourage or improve our work by taking on some of those uh, artistic educational traditions like uh, the CRIT that's used in a fine arts MFA um, or workshops, which, you know, I, I did tons of as, a, as an MFA student apprenticeships, reviews, and I, I mean, you know, uh, there's some of that starting to kind of pop up around the DH community, and I think that's really important. I mean, I think, you know, perhaps, I think Static Web is, a, is an excellent starting point for, for thinking about that kind of practice in that terms. Um, and what it is essentially is this, you know, it's mimetic training, right? You have these places to start, you can avoid the terror of the front page, that use this template button is so powerful, and you can go from there. Um, and I just wanted to show uh, one thing, this is, kind of my latest uh, project called Form. And this, I'm very literal minded. So, I, I mean, this is basically like mimetic training for poets. Um, and I've always been interested in kind of the shape of poems and how uh, thinking, you know, either mimicking or writing into poems might be a really valuable thing for a poet. And so this is something that I did over my sabbatical. It's still uh, very early and it has some copyright issues. So I, I will take it down um, after today. Um, but so I often write into uh, the snowman, which, you know, there's a, there's a, a number of interesting poems here. Um, if we wanted to look maybe at a, you know, and so it, it, but basically what it does is it, it takes a poem, fairly simple, you know, erases it and creates a form in its spot so that you can write a poem within it. So there's the original and there's the form. And so that's, that's a, kind of a way that I've been kind of driving my own writing practice 
um, and something I'm hoping to kind of make more public so that other people can do that too. And another part of this is, is uh, you know, what I found is that I, you know, I learned a lot about the poem by writing into the poem. Uh, and I also, you know, I, I've, I had this huge trove of data, and this is the copyright issue, that I, that's from kind of Poetry Foundation and some other places online. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot by kind of like, you know, putting, using that sort of generative uh, poem idea that we did with Control Shift and using that with the thing. So here, uh, these are language, yeah, this is language poems. So kind of the language poets are kind of like 1970s to, to now. Um, and you can kind of like create your own poems this way. Uh, you can edit the lines here if you wanted to get rid of something. You can say, oh, that's a good one. You've got a way you can make a black line. You link out to the poems and they're listed here. Uh, when you're done, you approve all the poems and then you save it uh, as a PDF. Um, so that's, that's kind of the literal expression of this idea. Uh, um, and I wanted to kind of uh, end at that point and sort of talk a little bit about a few caveats. You know, I, I, I've always, you know, a doubter. So I'm like, well, is this just all BS, right? Um, is it just another fad? Uh, are we just the developers driving the practice we want? You know, me and Olivia and Evan, like, this is, we do this, you should do this. You know, I, I, I worry about that thing and that kind of fine line between success and failure. And I think there's a lot of challenges to this model. I mean, and I totally understand that. Um, libraries and, you know, in, in presenting Collection Builder over this last year while we're on this IMLS grant, a lot of times I get on these presentations and realize that they, you know, I'm basically like a vendor to the people I'm presenting to, I'm, I'm pitching. And, and I get that I need to do that, but I also, but that's not the relationship I want to be in with, with this uh, development uh, way. Um, and it's, you know, it's not as easy. This takes some kind of conceptual leaps for people. It takes a, a more work on the maintenance side, um, but it, there's more rewards, rewards here too. And I also, you know, I think like these, these uh, projects um, like Collection Builder, like WAX, uh, and like Mukachu, so right down the road, uh, Kim Kristen works at Washington State and runs uh, the, the CDSC there and, and the Mukachu project. Um, and you know, I've talked to her about like, well, how do you maintain, how do you just keep, you know, they have all these grants and all these systems going to, to kind of keep building this community and they've done such an amazing job. I'm like, how do you keep it up? And you know, uh, and, and she's like, yeah, it's just, you know, you just kind of have to keep believing. And so that's a hard, that's a challenge for this too, right? I mean, having those sort of designated believers for these projects. Um, but I also think these are all opportunities, right? That 2.5% uh, kind of provocation from David Lewis. Like, what if we invested that in people, right? What if we invested that in kind of getting everybody up to speed here? Um, I think there's more rewards here and I think there's more kind of vitality and joy uh, here as well. So I'm gonna end one more poem. And I'm not gonna interpret this, I'm just gonna end it with it. Hammer, the stone arm raising a stone hammer dreams it can descend upon itself. When the quest is indecipherable, what is left is a career. What once was apprehended in passion survives as opinion. To be both author of this statue and the statue itself. Thank you very much. And I've got, uh, I'm gonna put the, the link to this presentation here too, but I've got a lot of learn static links, uh, some tutorials from my colleague Evan, uh, one on wax, uh, stuff on Jekyll, collection builder, oral history's data, um, and then links to some of the things we said here. Um, and I'm gonna put the, link to the Google presentation in the chat now. So uh, thank you very much. And I think we're open for discussion. Uh, got a few, you know, 20 minutes or so for discussion. Yeah, we usually go around 90 minutes. Um, and anybody else who's still in the room, we can, we can continue to talk about any questions you have for Devin. Um, and we can also talk more broadly about DH practice and teaching and implications of these tools. Um, just open it up to, to anybody who's here. And feel free to, um, I don't think you have access to the microphone. Is that right, Gail? So- um, No, people should be able to mute. Oh, cool, perfect. Um, so just unmute yourself if you have a question and we can um, go from there. Well, I, I, I knew, like, I was trying to get done before noon because I knew there would probably be so many people have to go. Um, but I appreciate you all staying around. 
I know it's a lot, it's, it's a little long, but I, I, I just had a lot to say, you know, I just you know, kind of didn't want to leave off so much of that. Hi. Hi. Can Hello. you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Devin, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually like sort of multitasking and working on um, some preparation for an Omeka project for S Omeka S for some students, a class that's coming up next week. Um, and this, of course, is getting me really excited because um, <laughs> like, oh yeah, Omeka, I'm just doing all these steps. <laughs> and why are we, why do I have to keep doing these steps? And so I'm just wondering if you or other people who've had, um, who've used Collection Builder with, a, um, with students. Um, I did have to miss a little bit. I had to pick up my daughter at the bus stop, but so I'm sorry if you did mention that. Um, uh, can you just give some examples of like, um, what are ways that you've involved students in the process of building these exhibits? Um, I guess the thing that, you know, I'm finding frustrating about Omeka is that, you know, it is really nice to have this kind of ongoing collection of like items used in student exhibits that they, that we can keep sort of generating. On the other hand, um, you know, so much of it is sort of front loaded on me. Um, and yeah. you know the few co the colleagues who are um, supporting it, and so um, what I'd like to see is something where students get involved more involved um, in building the collection in a sort of a little bit more lightweight um, manner. So yeah, I, I mean, thanks. so so we really we really forefront the data, right? So we get a collaborative Google Sheet and have them work on that. Uh, you know, when we do it, we usually do some scanning, and uh, that, that's sort of the process, but. If they're not doing that, if they're just creating a, an exhibit, uh, you know, either pulling in the metadata from somewhere else and, and kind of getting that sheet right, um, and then you know, in Collection Builder GH would be the one to use for that. Uh, you know, they can they'd have to sign up for GitHub, but then they can, there's just this, and this is all documented, but the, you know, they would have to go fill out. They can kind of choose what shows up on the cards and choose what shows up on the pages and choose uh, which which fields create the word clouds for the site. Um, and so they just start to edit little pieces. They're not having to do like real code editing, uh, but they're editing these config files essentially that, that do all that for you. Um, and then you can store the objects in an objects folder in Collection Builder GH rather than link out to them. So you can have it kind of as, a, as its own thing and then make that public using collection, using GitHub pages so that you can just leave it there. Um, I mean, I can link out to the, um, the history one uh, that we did. I mean, it, it, this really drove our great, using Omeka S really drove the creation of Collection Builder because of that. You know, I had to go and set up, it took me a day to set up the server to figure out all that, uh, the difficulty with the CSV kind of loading plugin, um, because that you want that to change too. And it's one of the most powerful things with the students is they'll mess it up, right? Things will break and the, there'll be a, you know, it's supposed to be in North Idaho and it ends up being in Australia. Uh, the, the, the map location, right? And so you can show them, oh, well, that's your data, that's a data issue. And you can change that and learn that, you know, data is really powerful to drive this stuff, but also that precision with detail and things too uh, makes a ton of sense for building these sites. So, so that's, I mean, I think it's easier. I think it's, it's definitely easier to maintain. Um, you can link out to the free, you don't have to have IT involved at all. You just need GitHub, you just need a GitHub account. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would just, I'd say go to the Collection Builder site and check out some of the documentation and Use that. I think we also have a, an article um, about static web in the classroom and sort of the benefits there. That was on the DH plus lib special fit, uh, thing, and I'll I'll link that um, here. But if I could ask a follow up question, which is like um, like you're. Um, from the instructor perspective, yeah, that seems great. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of feedback have you gotten from students as far as their experience? And I'm just also thinking about like, you know, a lot of our students, they have experience, you know, um, in social media, they've experienced maybe building their own site in WordPress, but just, you know, if you're working with students who really have no coding background, um, how, how, what, what kind of, are there, what barriers do you see in the sort of their experience? So if, I mean, there's a, there's, they're typically able pretty easily to work in a, in a collaborative spreadsheet. And we, we usually broke them into groups and they'd each create their own site. Uh, and then maybe they build it as a full, uh, like a, their own kind of polished site for the full class at the end. Um, but they, but that way they learned, you know, that sort of collaborative work within the spreadsheet, they, they were all pretty able to do. Um, setting up the kind of like going through the steps of, you know, I have a Git, I have a, a, a GitHub account and now I need to press this button and do that. You know, 
uh, putting that on them is they actually have not had too many issues with that. Um, and then just kind of showing, we usually just use the web interface so they don't have to pull anything down. And then they're just editing, essentially just showing them that it's, it's really you're teaching them GitHub and the GitHub web interface specifically. Uh, so there's not a ton of coding, but, and they're typically pretty used to kind of, you know, editing something in, in text files. We haven't seen too many issues there. I mean, things break sometimes. I mean, that's, and there'll be a frustration there. Um, you know, that's not exactly what they want. If you want to add a kind of interpretive piece and have them write like the about page and write it in Markdown, that's something you would need to teach. And Markdown is, is an easier way for them to learn kind of the HTML things. Um, but, the, and, you know, all, all the typical things that you would run into uh, teaching any sort of technology, frustration, um, some, some take to it easier than others. Uh, it, the group work was great because, you know, sometimes those who could kind of write would write and those who could who really like to tinker would tinker uh, and then bring it forward like that. Um, but but there's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about it as coding so much and try to, you know, I think it's like kind of, it's the filling, it's, it's filling, it's writing a text file. It's, it's, you know, a CSV is, you know, using that Google sheet is pretty, you know, fairly easy. Just making sure they understand the transformation of the file from the Google sheet to the CSV and how important that is to build the site and all that. I hope that answers some of the questions. Hey, Devin, thank you so much. This is super interesting and I'm really excited to um, experiment with it. And I've been meaning to learn wax for ages, but um, the whole digital exhibition uh, using static site generators is new to me. So this is great. Um, but I was kind of one, I had a question that was sort of similar to Laura's question about, um, and it like specifically for students who are very kind of like designers and visual thinkers but maybe don't have a ton of coding skills. Um, and I'm just like, and I don't think there's an easy answer to this, but like, if you're using this in a classroom, are, could you potentially be, you know, losing those opportunities for students to engage with something like that? I mean, we use Omeka sometimes, I think we use Scalar and WordPress more. Um, so mm -hmm. those are both more kind of like, there's like the, there's a strong focus on design and layout, obviously in Scalar. Um, Sure. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think this is a great, so I think one of the pieces about this, this, these approaches is that everything's sort of modular here and you can gear it towards uh, the pieces that you're wanting to teach. So if you want to teach GitHub and the collaborative aspects and the, and the track changes and the versioning, great. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go directly into the CSS, you can do that and show them kind of, you know, take them to bootstrap and show them some of the CSS things that are working there. And you can find the little individual modular pieces that you might want to do. Uh, we also have an option in our, um, in our, I think it's in the theme file, uh, yeah, the data like theme.yaml file, where you can use, because it's bootstrap, um, there's these boot swatches that, you, that are kind of like templates that you can change uh, right. all, yeah. like the whole look, right? It can be a different color, um, different kind of adjustments because, you know, they've just essentially, they're just overloading the, the bootstrap with different, you know, paddings and uh, border radius and all that. Um, and, it, and it changes the look entirely. Um, but uh, I also think, you know, depending on your own kind of uh, capacity for design and things like that, if you can show them like, oh, if you actually, you know, you change this um, the browse page has like, you know, it's on the 12 step grid. So each one's a call for, right? If you want to change that to uh, column to, to column six and make it two on a page, like what does that do to the design? Um, mm -hmm. Or change some of the font things and things like that. I mean, uh, it, or you can move the other part of the layouts pages. You can just move a few pieces around and the entire uh, look will change. I mean, that digital library of Idaho is essentially a collection builder with the nav on top. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot changes with just a few things. Um, but it's all in there. It's in there. They have to actually, you know, go in and, and see the code and yeah. move it, which is, I think, more powerful overall for a learning experience rather than just, you know, the, the kind of thematic ways that you can adjust a WordPress site, for instance, which is also often done through CSS. Mm -hmm. um, but it's you're pretty stuck to the theme once you get into the theme in WordPress. Yeah, I think, I mean, and this seems perfect for something like I do a summer fellowship program and this seems like it would be so great to have students working on that. But I just worry, I guess, about like the amount of time that I'm likely to get to work with a class during the semester um, and yeah. like what, you know, what is possible to teach them in that framework. But I definitely think this is super. 
Yeah. No, and I think you know you you do a little, and then you know I think at least they at least they have that now they've got a GitHub account, and if they want to start messing a little bit more, maybe they can come back later. I mean, I think you know you, you, there's there's only so much you can get done in those one offs anyway. Uh, yeah. But I think you can show them. You know, I, I feel like the data portion, the, the like that the data driven website mm -hmm. part of it, and that you're driving it with your own data is a really powerful thing. So doing an exercise like we did today, and just seeing that all of a sudden be a live website with you know cool you know interactive maps and everything else um uh that that can i think that just emphasizes how important the, the you know the data part is and and that's kind of you know where the where the, uh, the thrust lies for us i think uh this is evan um also just i think uh for a lot of uh in, it, it really depends on what kind of experience you're trying to have in the classroom with the students um, we've done it with some history students and, you know, a lot of the emphasis is really on kind of traditional archival research, but then being able to reset that in a slightly different way or lens. And so to them, they haven't worked with spreadsheets a lot, but working with spreadsheets is a pretty good skill to have. Um, you know, working with WordPress is a good skill because it runs like the majority of the web. Um, so I've done teaching with WordPress, but, uh, you know, when we're teaching about kind of archival research and for historians. You know that that little experience of reseeing their archives uh, data as data for the first time, and then working with it in a spreadsheet um, builds up a lot of kind of skills that they didn't necessarily have. But then also puts that lens of kind of rethinking, you know, some of that archival research in terms of a spreadsheet, um, which really makes a, a difference to their kind of perspective. Um, and so even though you know we're not getting to redoing the whole website and doing a lot of design with it, um, you know, that little part of it, and then seeing that being represented on the web uh, is really kind of a, a pretty big um, kind of revelation moment for some of that work. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different ways that you can, parts of the experience that you can get. I think there's opportunities to do some more. I mean, you know, we our tutorials right now are just kind of like, let's get it working and go. But I think that that's the thing I'm hoping with the community is like, you know, let's, is there a tutorial or something you can go to and really have a focus on the design aspect here or, or another aspect. And, and, you know, that, that's, that's where I hope it gets, like, that's where I hope the kind of creativity leads us um, to, to create some of those resources. And, and, you know, right now we're all just kind of learning how to step onto this and, and turn it on. Um, but I think there's kind of, you know, as you get more, more kind of uh, functionality and more, more work with all of this, I hope we can, we can create those resources as well. Yeah, Alex, ditto to or echo Alex's content here in the chat. It's nervous when I saw Alex pop on here. I was going to talk about him. Evan, I wonder if you could pull on the thread of the creative librarianship and how this intersects. Or I just want to hear a bit more about that. I, that was a really um, rich. I, yeah, idea. I mean, it, I think it's, you know, I, I just I feel like um, encouraging each other in that in that mode too. I mean, like looking like having like real like I feel like we we just so struggle to get the projects put up and we put them up and if they work we're done. And um, that sort of you know I I like the crits I like the ideas of workshops where you take things and let other people kind of talk about you know and it, I think that also kind of starts moving the conversation towards like. Oh, that's kind of a cliche way of doing that. Like, is there like, you know, I mean, like where, you know, like in, in poetry, you know, like you start to, you know, if you're, if you're in a workshop, people might be like, ah, oh, that's, I don't like, you know, I don't like how that's expressed or things like that. And if we're talking about kind of information design, interaction, things like that uh, in, a, in a more communal fashion and uh, are able to kind of advance that conversation, then we also get probably some newer versions of, of what we've seen so far. I mean, I think, you know, uh, there could be better information visualizations, period, for what we, you know, we have the content, <laughs> like we have all the content. That's, that's what I think is so like amazing about our jobs is, you know, I mean, you know, I, I have, you know, I've been here a decade, I could do another two decades with the content we have down in spec. Um, so that, you know, but, but thinking about the means of expression and developing the kind of um, steps for that. And, you know, I think we use that scholarly model so much for what we do in DH and, and DS that, you know, you publish the paper on it and you read the paper and you move from that. But 
you know, there's also means of kind of doing that in a, in a more like, uh, you know, gathering up a lot of the stuff that that's really great, like great example. I mean, a part of it is like the reviews and giving examples so people can learn from that, you know, so that people, you know, you know, like, oh, this site came out today. Like, I really want to check that out because that comes from this person. And that, that kind of happens already, obviously. But, you know, like, if it's, if it's in this kind of milieu, then we also can look to the code and think like, see a little bit more how it's done. I mean, I think with, with us, I mean, with Olivia and Evan and I, we're lucky to have each other, right? So we, we can kind of create that little environment, that little learning, uh, and we push each other and make things better that way. Um, I think the hardest part is, is in, in, you know, is just keeping up that documentation and uh, making sure that people, when people jump into this, they don't hit a snag and then have to back out. I mean, I think that's what's so hard when you do these tools and you're sort of putting these things out there for other people to use. Um, but if, if that's also you know a benefit of community if you have more people kind of going through and checking that and making sure that it works so that you know when you are starting in you're not running into these things that you know we don't have that much time so the minute something breaks most people are, are gone so that's a big challenge as well i think there's um you know these chances for uh sort of pragmatic and creative remixing of things and working within your limitations and and your skill sets and so every time that we have a new kind of grad student or faculty member come in and we start working with them, it brings these new ideas and we come up with new ways to change what we're doing to, you know, like try to build something out of those ideas. And then each one of those cascades back um, into our kind of templates and recycles around. And so I think part of that creativity is, yeah, just being able to work with people and then reuse those templates in different ways to, um, you know, come up with solutions that are interesting and um, communicate the kind of things that you want to talk about and, and do with the collections, um, rather than just saying, well, we have uh, content DM make a collection in it kind of thing is pretty limiting. Whereas um, being like, oh, you have this idea, let's just try to figure out some way that we can do it within the kind of set of skills and um, infrastructure that we have. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for creativity and within that, um, if you're willing to, you know, do some learning and, and figuring things out. So I, for, for me, this, the whole like static web has been a very deeply interconnection between learning and, um, you know, and then publishing that stuff out. Uh, and um, I think that's part of the process is, is more like focus on learning and, and teaching um, versus focusing on maintaining infrastructure or creating it or like uh, installing infrastructure essentially. So there's a lot of um, opportunity in that space. I think it's a great point about opportunity. I, f I feel like a lot of uh, some of our local initiatives have been more focused on infrastructure production. How many how many items have you produced, right? Like the idea of how do how do you shift that conversation if you're having it with administration to this creative moment or teaching and learning with digital objects rather than production of digital objects. Um, I don't necessarily have an answer to that. It's just well, an attention. And traditionally, we're creating a kind of a discovery experiences, right? As librarians, I mean, they talk they talk about serendipity in the stacks, but the, I mean, the thing I was thinking about is like serendipity is is you know, it comes from a lot of work, right? I mean, like you find something close to another thing because of a lot of catalogers. Um, but I mean, we've been we've been kind of you know curating those things for so long. Um, but yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, like. So I, I think there is that, you know, creating those experience, creating interactions, uh, it's just, it's a lot, it's sort of hard to see, you know, we can start to see that we can look at, you know, analytics and things like that and start to see some of that. But, um, but I think that, so there, so having people kind of have the expertise and, and use that expertise and be like kind of, you know, craft experts uh, with apprentices and things like that can really benefit uh, overall experience of our users. Uh, Alex, go ahead. I just don't want to keep us longer than we need. Um, I booked myself until four, but 
Um, the, um, like one of the things that I have here is multiple workflows depending on the people. Cause I actually don't, I, 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 in one sense, like I, it's easier for me sometimes with some faculty to, um, to just say, you know what, just here's the spreadsheet, just give me the spreadsheet. And like, uh, and like, give me the spreadsheet and like for the like uh, about page or like any kind of narrative or multimedia narrative, I'm like, and give me a Microsoft Word document. And I swear to God, it actually decreases the amount of time that I have spent on doing these websites with these kinds of projects with faculty. I'm happy to share examples with, with any of you of those kinds of projects that got done that way. That's a kind of service tech support site where I just like, no, just give it to me. Uh, I'm just gonna do it. And I spent like 10 hours doing them. And that was it. There was no teaching. And uh, there's no teaching, no transfer of knowledge, nothing. And actually the faculty walked away happy with the site. And I ended up working less. And of course the library is spending, the library or my library already understands that the cost of sysadmin and DevOps is goes way down when we do it this way. And we have like now a whole even system set up uh, uh, with like Travis before it goes to GitHub. So it's everything is running automatically at like two pennies a, a year for a project on Amazon cloud or something, something ridiculous like that. But anyways, so then other projects are like, yes, let's learn. Uh, and like, uh, like where I'm going to teach you like how to like get this stuff installed, which is the biggest pain point installing any one of these things uh, is like going to take hours. And then I'm going to use the opportunity to also teach you basics of coding, you know, and data and metadata. And we're going to go deep into it in two months, three months of, of time invested in some people, the students, more, mostly students, uh, uh, less faculty. And then there's somewhere in between where I'm just like, well, I'll teach you some things like metadata, like let's play like two courses. We'll play around with metadata a little bit. You fill out a spreadsheet. We'll still do them. Uh, maybe we'll do a markdown on GitHub. And so I have a continuum. And I was wondering if you guys also had a continuum of services that range from like, you know what, don't worry about it. Just send me this. You're not gonna learn anything, but you already know how to do a spreadsheet, I hope. Just send me that in a folder of events. Two though, like, no, I'm gonna teach you how to be me. Uh, uh, that, uh, yeah. Um, how, yeah, how do you handle that? Absolutely, I mean, I think like, uh, the CCC in Idaho project is is that, the first thing you described, it's, it's a, um, these uh, a, a couple who, who have run this who are older an older couple uh, she is a professor in communications and you know she's really interested in all this and she you know she's come to workshops and things like that but what, what but they don't have time a lot of it is and, and really what they want is they know what they want to see and so they can describe that to me and they can send me then the Microsoft Word and they can do the spreadsheet and you know we've done a lot of the spreadsheet for them even uh, but they can fill out you can they can go back and edit some of that. And then we can create the project. Whereas, like right now, that story and extinction site uh, with the, with the map, you know, I'm working with the grad students, and I think this is really a great opportunity for them to learn how to kind of write with the collection. Um, and so we've, you know, we've built in a lot of pieces into like our about pages and um, into projects like that where they can kind of, you know, write in Markdown and use some learn how to use an include command to like include an image here or include a map here. Uh, based on, and they can filter it. And so they can even start to learn a little programming that way. Um, and, and that's written really, that's what I, I see as like a real possibility so that they don't have to like do this project. And then there, I think it's gonna be their thesis project and then step out of it and write a 40 page document about this. Like that just, you know, that's totally, that'll never, that will not be seen as much as the actual website that is out there too. So they're writing for different audiences that way too. I mean. I just think there's a lot to be learned by thinking and writing with these collections too. But, um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, that's a lot of work on my part, right? I mean, cause then I, I'm also, I'm, I'm in that pitch mode too. I'm like, I'm to convince them that it's worth their time to, to get through this, which I, I don't think it's going to take too much more time, but yeah. And, and then, you know, students the same way, you know, in a class where, you know, if they're writing a, uh, an essay about their experience in the project, can we get them to a point where they don't where they feel comfortable enough to write in Markdown? Um, we don't know. That's something we're hoping to kind of more explore next year. Uh, with it. We've got a couple of kind of projects um, going forward. So uh, definitely, though, I, I definitely hear what you're saying about the continuum and, and we approach kind of that's one of the first things we establish kind of with the fellows that we have uh, in the in the projects that come in through us through our shop. Thanks, Devin, for a great talk. Thank you.
Well, I'm going to note it's um, 1.33 and thank everyone for uh, participating, um, being here even at the end of, uh, of the 90 minutes. Um, Sarah and I will be, uh, will be distributing the slides and the videos. Uh, we'll also be watch the list there because we'll put out a reminder about consultations. And then we're eyeing a session probably later spring. Um, not quite sure on the topic, um, possibly around uh, research or DH centers, uh, administration and, and just management and that kind of idea. So um, stay tuned and we'll, um, we'll stay in touch. Thank you all. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone, yeah. for coming. Thanks, Thanks Evan. Deb that was so fun. Yeah.